Hello, and thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm very excited to share this project with you, uh, Ursa Music for Tuba by Women Composers. Um, this project actually did, it started as my doctoral dissertation, uh, but two years, I completed it two years ago, uh, my dissertation, and also graduated at that point in 2013. I'm still really proud and also very passionate about uh, this subject matter. So, is that what I need? Yep. So as, as a young middle and high school student, the fact that the tuba was predominantly played by men was a fairly obvious one. Uh, from that point, really continuing to today, I've, I've enjoyed breaking that sort of stereotype or mold of what is a typical tuba player. Um, it wasn't until I got into my master's, though, and then doctoral program that I noticed that there seemed to be a similar ratio of women to men composers as well. Um, it was at that point I decided that as a woman tubist, I would be, be really great to promote the women in the composition field, an equally male-dominated field, which I did through my dissertation project, uh, recording a CD of works by all women composers. So this CD is comprised entirely of pieces that had not that have not been previously recorded by anybody. So there's no was no recording available, um, and the intention was basically to bring uh, attention to the comp these composers that had not been previously recognized. So the first step in that sort of journey was finding these composers. Uh, the from start to finish, this project took about a year and a half uh, to complete. So in the spring of 2012, I compiled a list of 20th and 21st century women composers using my personal music library, the Mills Music Library, YouTube, colleague suggestions, things like that. Um, and I explored these composers' websites, found what works they had composed for the tuba in particular, uh, and you know, in what setting, I listened to samples of their works, and from that, I contacted 10 composers, uh, inquiring about their works in general, and in some cases about specific compositions and whether or not they had been recorded. Because again, I, wanted to, I really wanted to make sure that everything that went on this CD, it was a premiere recording, uh, simply again to get these new works out there. So I narrowed this down to seven composers, five of whom had already written a piece uh, for the tuba that I wanted to record, and two others who I ended up actually commissioning or hiring to write a brand new work, which I'll get to uh, in a little bit. So in the summer and fall of 2012, after figuring out what pieces I wanted to play, I then had to learn all of the music, which you know was time consuming and hard, but that's normally what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. This was really, for me, the easiest part of the whole process, since it was the most familiar. Um, but since there were no previous recordings of any of these pieces, um, I, I had to be, or I tried to be in more contact with all of the composers, because there were no previous recordings to sort of go off of when learning the piece. I wanted to make sure, especially since I was going to be doing the first recording of these pieces, that I was representing the piece in a way that the composer wanted, and not just the way that um, I thought it, it should go. So the next, uh, the next step, which was really the, the longest and most arduous, uh, was recording and then editing. So the CD recording process, it involved uh, many different people, including my collaborators, so the, my pianist, for the whole project was a, a fellow doctoral student named Kirsten Eady. I, there's a percussionist on the CD, uh, and then also a trombonist, and actually the trombonist in the trombone tuba duo, Bell Collective. Um, it also involved the recording engineer, uh, Marv Nunn, and then what we call uh, tone meisters, which a tone meister is basically the same thing as a producer. So they would sit in the recording studio with the recording engineer and listen to what I'm playing and mark on a musical score moments that I might not be happy with. And basically then when I finish playing a certain segment, they could then say, you might want to focus on this or make sure you do this again. Uh, that is sort of their job. So I recorded the CD over a period of seven days total. Uh, four of the days were in January, and then three of them were uh, later in March. Um, each of the recording sessions, they lasted normally between three and four hours. Uh, so what I would do for 
and I'll, I'll try and explain this, and it's, if it's confusing or if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt and ask. Um, I would pick basically a piece or a movement of a piece, a lot of these were multi-movement pieces, um, for each day. And before the recording ses session, I would do divide that piece into really small segments. So generally 30 to 60 seconds of music. Um, I would record each of these little tiny segments a minimum of three times. Uh, so just that 30 seconds, which was super bizarre at first, because you know, as musicians, we're used to performing, we're used to performing something in its entirety from beginning to end. So this isolation thing, it, it feels, uh, it doesn't feel great because it feels it's really unsatisfying because you're just playing these tiny little chunks of music, um, and in between, so I'd record something these like a 30 second chunk three times in a row. In between each take, I'd get feedback from both the recording engineer and again that that tone meister, um, basically telling me things that went well or that okay you might want to they chip that note the first two times. Make sure you you know you're focusing on that note this third time, and if if they thought I had it it. That 30 seconds well covered within three takes, we'd move on to the next 30 seconds. If not, then they might say, might narrow it down to like a five or 10 second take, get even more specific with that, until all of the music was recorded to the best of my ability. Now this, this whole process of recording for me, again, was brand new. Uh, it was, see, it felt really slow, felt really arduous and frustrating. I get frustrated somewhat too easily when it comes to my own playing and practicing. And I had thought the recording process was, was this way. But I hadn't started editing yet. So <laughs> the, the recording process, it took me about 20 hours total uh, to get all of the music down. Um, for the editing process, I then had to go through each of the takes. So you know, multiply. 30 second take, three of three to six of them each multiplied over what ended up being about a 60 minute CD. So that's all the music I'm listening to. And I would basically take each small segment, listen to all the takes, figure out what, basically almost note by note or measure by measure, what's the best thing from each take. Obviously, I wanted to get as big of a chunk as possible so there's less editing. Um, but we're perfectionists, as I'm sure many of you are as well, and you know you want it to be the best product it can be. Uh, so I basically bracket in a musical score what uh, from each what measures I wanted from each what what track of music had been recorded, um, and mark that down, and then give that to the recording engineer. He'd take the musical score and then basically splice these different musical segments together. Um, so that for him was an equally long process, but he was getting paid to do it. So uh, that, that's sort of his job. But I'd then get a, uh, the, he'd send the complete version back to me once it all had been spliced together. And I would listen to that basically to make sure it was accurate. Uh, this took, as I said, a ton of time. Um, so I spent about 20 hours recording for a 60 minute CD and about 45 to 50 hours editing. So it's, it was a, a, lot of, a lot of work, but a, a very good, um, it was also a good learning process in that as well. So after recording, you know, I, I and just editing and finished the CD, finished it as my, this was again my doctoral dissertation project, graduated, great. And then using some of my personal and then also professional references, um, I was put in touch with Mark Records, which is a record uh, company based in New York State. Um, and I worked with them to finalize the CD, and they secured kind of the uh, both recording and also distribution rights. That's a whole other thing that I didn't have any awareness of at that point. Um, and then also come up with the graphics for the CD. Uh, the CD, which was the first slide that they came up with that graphic. Um, and it was released in November of, of 2013. Um, so as I kind of alluded to, funding a CD project like this when you're not a platinum artist is expensive. <laughs> and that was a whole other sort of side of the project that I had to make sure I had under control. Um, you know, you're paying for your collaborators. So I was paying for my pianist, the recording engineer, 
uh, paying Mark Records to release my CD. They're not paying me, I'm paying them. Um, portions of these, a very small portion of these funds came, came from my own personal funds. Uh, but at the time, and really not much has changed, but I was a very poor graduate student and I don't have just tons of money laying around to spend on a recording project. Um, so I had to come up with the funds in some other way and I ended up using uh, Kickstarter. Has anyone heard of Kickstarter? Great. So you all kind of know what that is. That's fantastic. Um, so I set up basically a Kickstarter project to raise money for the production and release of the CD. Um, you know, I did the whole rewards thing. So I had a, I think it was a, it was running for 30 days, I think is what it was, and I had a recording goal of $5,500, yeah, $5,500, and uh, it, it funded actually in nine days. So I was really fortunate. It, it funded really quickly. I never expected that to be the case. And basically what I that did at that point was I said, okay, any money over this amount, I'm gonna create a fund that will go towards commissioning future works from women composers. So I ended up funding um, about $1,200 over my goal amount, which was really nice. Um, so speaking of commissioning composers, that was another major part of this project. So did you, does anyone know what, do you guys know what commissioning means, what I mean by that? I see some nods. So commissioning basically is hiring a composer to write you a new piece of music that's never, that's brand new. You know, it's like writing a story or a play, something totally new that's never been uh, played before. So I really wanted, as part of this project, to commission or hire a composer to write at least one new piece for the CD. Um, again, with the idea of bringing another composer, woman composer, to light to a larger audience. So commissioning a new piece of music, it can seem like a really daunting or also confusing task. It seemed that way to me. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing for most of this project. It was all, a lot of guesswork on my part. Um, and again, the other, ch other challenging thing is, you know, I'm not, I didn't have a ton of money. And commissioning requires money because you need to pay the composer. Um, one reason that I wanted to commission uh, is to bring, again, new music into the world. Compared to the violin or the flute, the tuba has a relatively small body of solo repertoire. It's a much younger instrument. Um, and it's really only been in the past 50 years or so that the tuba has really been taken seriously as a, uh, solo, as a solo instrument, believe it or not. It actually is taken seriously in that way now. Um, and again, another reason for me was to pr promote women composers. Um, so I also, as the project went forward, I realized another reason I wanted to commission uh, that didn't occur to me as for, at first is that composers, they actually, they, for the most part, they want to work with performers. Uh, unlike performers and conductors, they don't get to work with people on a daily basis, right? I'm, I get to rehearse with people, I get to work with conductors. Composers are often, which is why we get sort of a weird composer stereotype, they're often locked in their office by themselves, writing away, and you know, you kind of get that crazy composer um, idea going. But for, like as I said, for the most part, they really actually do want to work with people, and that was another reason I, I really enjoyed uh, this process. Um, so the next thing is basically, uh, unless you have an idea of who you want to commission, is finding these composers. Um, unless you know a composer and their music really well, uh, this can also be somewhat uh, difficult. You, you know, if, if you don't know a composer, you don't know their music, hiring someone to write you something it's, it's kind of, you know, you don't know what you're going to get and you may hate it. And that's also terrifying because, you know, I, with this project, I was like, yeah, you write me a piece and I'm going to record it on my CD, which is then getting put out there for whoever to listen to and will partly represent me as a professional. So for research, you know, in terms of finding these composers, um, I used like what anyone would use, the internet. And I searched, again, sort of like when I was finding music for the CD itself, a number of different composers. Uh, basically, I, I also talked to colleagues, tried to figure out, okay, who do you recommend? Who, who seems like would be a good fit for a project like this? Um, 
I also wanted to find a composer that was within driving distance from where I was living, which at the time was in Madison, Wisconsin, because I wanted to be able to actually work with them in person. Uh, and finally, I thought it would be great to, if the composer had experience, basically writing for the tuba because it wouldn't, they already knew the language. It's a different mu instrument to write for than the piano or the flute. Um, so I, I kind of took all of that into account and I ended up commissioning a composer by the name of Asha Srinivasan. And she's the professor of composition at Lawrence University, which is in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, her first year on faculty at Lawrence was in the fall of 2008, which was the term after I graduated from, I, that's where I did my undergrad, uh, from Lawrence. So she started the term after I finished. Uh, and she was one of the first composers that really came to mind when I first started thinking about this project. I had a friend that had commissioned her. He really liked the work. I, I, I went on her website, listened to a number of her pieces, and I thought they seemed um, really interesting. So <clears throat> I found out pretty quickly, too, that Asha was also very well known in the electronic music field, which, OK, that's a completely different instrumentation than really you know, the typical. What's more typical is like tuba and piano. So this kind of went outside that box, which is one thing I was looking for. Um, also, Asha is also Indian American. And a lot of her music, she uses uh, modal harmonies and kind of the raga based rhythms. So I, that also to me was very interesting. But she writes it in a western style. So which actually ended up being more complicated because it was, the rhythms were all over the place. But um, it, you know that also to me was very interesting. So I, I contacted her in April of 2012 to see if she had any interest in doing this. Um, and even though she never had written for tuba, Ever, she was really excited about it because it was her opportunity to also expand really what she could write for. Um, so that was that was actually that was the one of two pieces I ended up commissioning. The other one, when I as I said when I proposed the project, I only intended to commission one, but then I attended uh, the International Women's Brass Conference in Kalamazoo, Michigan, in June 2012. Um, I was attending this conference as a member of Bell Collective, which is this trombone tuba duo. And we attended a bunch of different recitals. And we, on one of the recitals, one of uh, Inez McComas' pieces was featured. And it was for trombone and recorded sound. And hearing this piece, Inez, she really writes in a very fun, audience-friendly way and uses actually real life sounds in her pieces. So this, the piece that we heard, it was basically, uh, it was about traveling. So it had train noises and horn honking and you know things you'd actually hear in real life, which I thought was uh, really cool. So we decided basically to contact her as well and say, would you be you know, willing to write a piece for us? So these were the relationships I had with these two composers were uh, similar, but also uh, very different. W one thing that's interesting about this composer-performer relationship, and as a musician, it's, it's a little bit strange to think about. But in it, this will sound really obvious, but um, when you're commissioning a composer, the composer is alive. So, they exist. You can talk to them. You know, it's not like we, for the most part, we're working on pieces where the composer's no longer around, um, and you can't have that sort of personal connection. Um, for this project, I made an effort to contact not just the two people I commissioned, but every the, every composer that was represented on the CD, and that also greatly influenced how I was learning the pieces and how I then recorded uh, the works. So. For me, building these relationships with the composers, really be beyond the notes on the page, um, it added, for me, added a new element of depth and understanding to the meaning and the piece. And this, I, I think this also holds true for, for other areas of study as well, in terms of you know, basically getting in contact with those people um, who you're studying or who you hold to a high regard, who inspires you. you know, I think it can be it can bring a subject matter to a higher level if you get kind of a personal connection going, um, and so when commissioning these pieces, this composer performer relationship it is a very personal one. And working with Asha and Inez, 
um, was a true collaboration. It wasn't just hand, them handing me a piece and saying, OK, play this just like it is, no changes. Um, so that was also, for me, very interesting. So there were similarities in the relationships between these, these two, but there were also different experiences. Appleton was two hours from Madison, so I had an opportunity to go work with Asha um, a number of times. Um, Inez, though, she at the time lived down in Florida, and we had never really corresponded at all except via email um, until Sarah, who's a trombone player, and I met in uh, January to rehearse the piece, and we sent Inez actually an audio file of the piece, and um, basically to get her critique and comments, and then had a sort of a FaceTime call with her. And that was the first time I had actually seen her uh, besides a picture. So that it's great to have you know, the ability to go and meet with a composer face to face, but it's also entirely possible to commission a piece from a distance as well. Um, as I mentioned before, Inez uses this really fun, accessible language in her, in her works. And we didn't quite understand the piece that she had written for us until we had a chance to talk to her and really see how her personality was really reflected in this music, really outgoing, really engaging. And basically, Sarah and I needed to let loose and have fun a little more with the piece. And we didn't realize that until we had a chance to talk to her. So I'm going to kind of skip through some of the fee stuff. But you know, there's a variety of ways to find and work with composers, there's also a variety of ways to fund a, a commission. Um, these commission fees, they base, are based on a number of factors, you know, kind of listed on the board. How experienced is the composer? Generally, a commission fee, a, a composer has a per minute rate that they'll then adjust. So some composers, it goes up to about $1,000 a minute. That gets to be a very expensive piece of music. Um, that was not the composers I was dealing with, which was, which was good. Um, and composers will adjust their permanent fee based on these other three things, the personal relationship you have with them, and also the complexity of the, should say, instrumentation. The last three letters got cut off. So the benefit of working with a composer like Inez is she was just like me as a sort of up and coming performer. She was an up and coming composer. And she decided basically that she didn't need an actual monetary amount for the piece. We paid her through performances. So she wrote a piece that was seven minutes long, and we basically agreed that every minute we'd give her one performance at least. So she wrote the seven minute piece, we owed her seven performances. And that was fantastic, because it was no money out of um, our pockets in that way. So. The way, though, that I funded um, Asha's work was through a consortium. Does it, do you have, you, have you heard of a consortium before? OK, so a consortium, basically, it's kind of a gathering, getting a group of people together to fund a project that you're heading. So um, in this case, well, first of all, back up. She and I had agreed on a commission rate of $3,000 for a 10-minute piece. And then she kind of based that on her uh, mit per minute rate. Um, so back in the early stages of finding and selecting compo uh, a composer, um, I had an idea as to what whatever the commission fee ended up being, there's no way I was going to be able to pay the whole thing myself. And yeah, I, I could not afford a $3,000 commission all by myself. Um, so I had heard of consortiums before, and but this was a new experience for me as well. Um, so what I did was I initially I wanted to create basically this group of all women tuba players who would each contribute a certain dollar amount towards that $3,000. So it's like kind of like a group effort, which I was l leading to pay for this piece of music. Um, so I contacted about 15 women tuba players, which also should give you an idea as to the ratio of women to men in this field, which I'll get into. Uh, that was all I really could find that were at that, that I knew of and that I found through making other contacts that are at a level, sort of at a, you know, either a graduate or uh, professional level. So there aren't very many of us. And that proved to be challenging. So I received a positive reply from four. And my goal was eight. So at that point, I was like, OK, I guess I have to open this up to men, which was fine. And I ed ended up adding about. Um, 
three more people to the, to the consortium. So there's seven people, eight people total, including me. Um, so each member of the consortium, they contributed uh, $250. And in return, they received a copy of the work. And we had like what's called an ex exclusivity period. So only me and the other seven could perform the piece in the first year. And that was kind of the deal you got. Um, so as I said, my initial consortium goal was eight members in addition to myself, covering $2,000 of the $3,000 fee. Um, I didn't really want to contribute more than $1,000 of my own money. Uh, so the, it ended up totaling $2,750 from the consortium. So I was like, OK, I guess I can fork over the extra $250. But at that point, Asha and I had established a, a really great uh, personal relationship and rapport. And she basically said, you know, I've, I've noticed that you didn't reach your consortium goal. How about I just drop the, the fee of the of the project down to what matches that. So I, I mean, that was fantastic. So I ended up paying my same $1,000, and it, it worked out uh, fantastic in that way. So, and I don't think that would have happened had I not really established that relationship with her. Asha was also very small. <laughs> She's a good foot shorter than me, so that was also a, a funny thing. But uh, so. A lot of the work that went into this project uh, was administrative, you know, emailing, contacting composers, performers, figuring out this funding stuff. Uh, but the most, by far, enjoyable thing of this whole process was working with Asha and working with these composers. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give you a brief rundown of how we kind of, how our relationship worked. Um, we initially met at Lawrence in April of 2012 basically to discuss ideas for the piece, um, the length, the type of uh, instrumentation, electronics used. Since she's an electronic music composer, I decided to go that route. Um, and this was since this was her first time composing for tuba. I also played for her and showed her you know, the range of the instrument, the different sort of what we call extended techniques on the horn. So besides just standard playing, you know, we can do this thing called multiphonics, just singing and playing. Um, flutter tongue, which is like rolling your Spanish R while playing. Just these, they make weird sounds. So, and she she liked that. So also inter basically introducing her to the to the instrument overall. Um, so based on that meeting, we decided that the piece would be for tuba and um, electronic accompaniment, and it would focus on more of the lyrical and expressive qualities of the playing because that's something that I uh, really liked about. Uh, my own playing. So it's being written for me, so I felt like I could request certain things. Uh, and we also agreed that the piece would include modal, these modal and rhythmic elements reminiscent of her own heritage. Um, we met for the second time in October of 2012. She had pre pretty much written the whole piece by that point. And uh, it was the first time she would be hearing the tuba part on anything except a MIDI file. So she's just hearing it through her computer at that point. And the first time I would be playing the piece for her. So driving up to Appleton that day, uh, I was very nervous because, OK, what if she didn't like the way I was playing the piece? Um, what if I sound, it sounded like what she was, what wasn't what she was envis envisioning? Um, but I got there, and it, it didn't take me very long to realize that Asha was feeling the exact same way, if not even more nervous than I was. Um, you know, coming from her standpoint, she had no idea if I even liked the piece. You know, and that's, I can understand why that would be nerve wracking. Or if it, that it worked on the tuba, because she had never written for tuba before. Um, but we got over that relatively quickly and realized that neither one of us were necessarily judging the other, um, but just trying to make the other one happy. So that ended up working out really well. So we worked together on the piece, made changes and adjustments. She li would listen to me play certain things, and then actually change things in the score based on what she was hearing. Um, and using notes from that meeting, she then finished the piece, which I got in December 2012. Uh, we continued to work together throughout the winter, basically perfecting the electronic part in particular for her. Um, and I premiered the piece in March 2013 at Lawrence uh, at my alma mater, which was also um, a fun thing to do. And she was sort of an integral part of that premiere in that she was there 
uh, specifically making changes to the electronic part as it was playing, and then later made changes for the final version that I uh, that got sent out to people and that I recorded with. Um, I recorded the piece later that same week after the premiere, and Asha actually came down to Madison for it. That was also daunting. Um, Asha, and I understand, I, I started understanding very quickly as to why she worked in electronic music. She's a huge perfectionist. And with electronic music, it can be perfect. There's, you know, you, you don't have human error in electronic music. Um, but I play a brass instrument. <laughs> and I know many of you, well, probably all of you have no experience playing brass instruments, but we're not perfect. And it's really hard to have a perfect performance. So I was very nervous in terms of, OK, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the recording session, because I think she's just going to be so nitpicky about everything that I'm doing that, you know, so that was my big concern. Um, and I even warned my, the producer, the tone meister of this, like, can you make sure that you keep her, like, can you, he was a trombone player, can you keep her kind of focused and not, you know, getting too critical of me. But and all of that ended up being basically completely unjustified. She was fantastic, really helpful, and in the end I'm incredibly happy that she was was there. So overall this this collaboration with Asha, it was a really fantastic experience and probably the most meaningful part of this whole project for me. Um, this project in its entirety, from commissioning new pieces, recording, as I said, mentioned at the beginning, it was a massive, massive learning curve and also an invaluable experience. And I'm, I couldn't imagine doing a better or different uh, d dissertation project. So the other thing that I want to talk about briefly is being a woman in this world. As I mentioned at the beginning of today's talk, this project was inspired by the fact that I fall outside of the typical tuba player stereotype, which is described very nicely by Garrison Keillor. Um, tuba players are stocky, the stereotype, are stocky men um, you know, who do manly things like hunting and fishing and camping, what, you know, et cetera. Um, when the tuba was first being considered a serious instrument, which was around 1950s, women weren't playing it at all. Uh, they, we were, it's, women were considered too delicate, you know, it wasn't, they couldn't handle it. Uh, there were even things out there that um, women shouldn't play a brass instrument when they're pregnant. So, you know, things like, like this very, I mean, this carries over into other fields too, but it was an interesting time for that. They were painted with the instruments, you know, as sort of more of a sex symbol, which I also find equally interesting. Um, but the tuba is an instrument for women to play, considered way too much for them to handle. As this time has gone on, though, obviously this has changed. Um, more and more women are playing the instrument and have completely sort of de debunked this idea. Uh, and for the most part, I really don't hear much directly about being a woman in this field. Uh, sometimes, though, I, I do hear statements, mostly from older amateur musicians and also non-musicians, like, Wow, I've never heard a girl, you know, play the tuba like you do, or play the tuba, period. Um, or how does someone your size manage to handle an instrument like that? Um, or sometimes going into, you know, I didn't know girls could play the tuba. You must really give the boys a run for their money. You know, so hearing these things, it always catches me off guard because I don't, I don't think about myself in that way. Uh, and so it's always a kind of a, a weird thing. Oh yeah, I guess this still is a thing. This still is some, still something that people think about. Um, one of the most direct comments that I received, it came in the form of actually a re Amazon review of my CD, and it's on Amazon, you know, right now. And I had to go. I actually went back and <laughs> to to copy and paste it. I assume it was it's from a well-meaning individual, but this review reads. <laughs> Being a male tuba player, this is a bit distressing. A truly great female tuba player playing good tuba geek music by very good women composers. 
Seriously, my hat's off. Stephanie Fry is a terrific player. Well, this is one more male myth shattered, so I guess I'll hang out at the local Starbucks sipping on tea all day long. Seriously, if you collect tuba music, add this one to the heap. It makes me want to move to East Tennessee, wherever that is, to go steady, I mean go study with her. So <laughs> that was shocking to read. Um, and I, I suppose I, I guess I somewhat appreciate this very backhanded compliment. It really does highlight a perception that I had hoped didn't exist any longer, or in my own head that I don't think exists any longer, but um, it does. So I'm, I'm often asked uh, as well what it's like being a woman in, in my field, um, how I handle it, what's led to my success. Again, I don't think too much about that. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, yeah, I have one, I have one a female student right now. I have 11 male students. <laughs> you know, it's, it is a definite you know, ratio difference, but it's not something I ever focus on, and honestly, I don't think my students focus on it either. Um, back in sixth grade, when I had to choose an instrument, I didn't go with what my friends were choosing, which was mostly the flute and the trumpet and clarinet, things like that. Um, I picked what I thought was the coolest sounding and also looking instrument. Um, in a way, I, the instrument sort of picked me. Uh, and that's what the first thing, uh, what I believe is the first thing that uh, main component as to why I've been successful, and that is my passion, basically passion for what I do. Um, from the moment I first picked up the instrument until now, 20 years later, um, I have absolutely loved performing, teaching, living, breathing music. If that love and passion weren't there, I certainly would not be where I am now. Um, as Probably all of you know, though, passion doesn't take you all the way. <laughs> there has to be something else. Uh, it needs to be coupled with excellence, hard work and excellence. So over the past 20 years, I have dedicated thousands of hours striving to be the best performer and musician that I can be on this instrument, and, and also educator as well. Um, making myself as competitive as possible in this field that just happens to be comprised of mostly men. Um, if I weren't passionate about what I'm doing, I wouldn't have the drive to obtain the excellence. Um, so these two things, these ideas of passion and excellence, are, are really why, they're, they're what I think about every day, even I never really realized that that's what I was thinking about every day. Um, and they're why I believe I've been successful, not just as a woman, but as a, music, as a musician in the, in the tuba world. So I'd like to close today by performing a very short movement from one of the works on this CD. This is a movement from an unaccompanied piece, meaning it's just tuba by itself, which made it a little easier for in here, um, by Canadian composer Elizabeth Raum. And the piece is called Sweet Dances, and it's S-W-E-E-T, it's all play on words. And the first movement is called Blue Tango, and it's B-L-E-W, Tango. So if you have any questions, I would love to answer them following uh, the performance. Thank you. 
thank you again for listening. If you have any questions, please, I'd love, love to talk about any of this. Where do you, what are you seeing yourself doing over the next five years? The next five years, uh, I guess more of what I'm already doing, so teaching, wherever that may end up being. Um, I, I do love teaching at a university. That's I, I love the I love working with college age students. I would love to work at a place where I could have a grad, work with graduate students as well. We don't have those in the music department, so um, so working with students, teaching that's become more and more of a passion, more more than I thought it was going to be. Uh, I play in a, a tour with a, a brass quintet, so we do a, about one one week full week tour a semester and then we're actually going to be in the Northwest, Washington, uh, Oregon, and uh, Idaho for a month in May. So I play with, I tour with them and with some other, um, I'm going to be actually at um, Converse College in Spartanburg with Bell Collective, not this weekend but next weekend. So playing a lot, playing and teaching. That's primarily what I see myself doing. <laughs> Yeah. What keeps me going? Uh, I guess just I get to do what I love doing every day. Uh, I get to work with people every day as well. So um, sometimes it's hard to keep in my, like remember that my students actually are human beings as well. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, the fact that I get to work with them, I get to work with my colleagues. Um, I play in a, um, a sort of an avant-garde chamber ensemble here, here with some faculty on campus with Heather Kilmeyer and Alan Stevens called Dada Cabaret. And if, if you have any interest in watching a, it's a narrated show throughout and it's, uh, it's rated R, we call it rated R. Um, the content is completely inappropriate for children. Um, and the music, but the music is all uh, really contemporary and actually very serious music. So it's our way of sort of showing or getting con serious contemporary music out to the Johnson City community um, in a sort of audience friendly way. Um, so that's another thing that keeps me going. But yeah, I mean, I get to do what I love every day. And I can't imagine, I mean, what, what else would I be doing? <laughs> it's fantastic. Where can you purchase your CD? Um, from me, if you'd like to. <laughs> I actually have some here with me, if anyone would like a CD. Um, they're ten dollars, so that's. They, or you can also buy it on, you know, it's on Amazon and iTunes, and um, it's on Spotify. So if you have a Spotify subscription, also on there.